Okay. That reminds me of a, a Muppet show where they had the sketch. Uh, last time in the animal hospital, uh, and there was a scene where Miss Piggy had forgotten something during a surgery or the Swedish <laughs> cook. So how started like that last time? I want to recall a few things of last time to, to put in context. So um, a V is uh, oriented um, Euclidean space. And um, S of V as the units here. In V. So if we have uh, X sitting in X in V, excuse me, it's compact, smooth, so manifold. Um, then um, it has a uh, normal bundle. Tx, normal bundle of uh, x and v, and this is the unit. Uh, this is the unit uh, sear bundle associated to it, and this sits inside S v cross v. This is sort of the unit uh, uh, tangent unit tangent bundle, and this is a Lagrange. This is a uh, contact manifold. And this is a uh, oriented Legendrian sub manifold. It's compact, and you should think of this as a current of integration sitting in there. Now, I'm going to draw a picture of, uh, of uh, this unit normal bundle sitting inside this, which you'll have to stretch your imagination. So this is going to be V, and this is the unit tangent bundle. So it's a fiber over, over the origin. Um, and since I'm here, I, I want to put a, I want to put a cotangent bundle here. This is the natural, this is the natural thing. So this is, the, okay. So this is, what, what you see here is the unit uh, sphere in the, in, the, in the dual space. And somewhere here is x, and somewhere here is the unit uh, conormal bundle. Okay. Now I will denote the elements in here in xi. So xi is an element in v star. Um, and it has norm one. Good. And remember what is the graph? Graph of d c. The graph of d c. Well, if we if I look at this picture, it's going to be the point c v, where v is in v. Equivalently. If I, if I uh, denote by pi the projection onto, uh, onto this component, this is, not a natural this is not a natural projection. It just happens because the tangent uh, bundle of V is trivial. 
So I'm projecting on the fiber over zero, think of it this way. Then gamma, uh, gamma d xi is the same as pi inverse of xi. The fiber, the fiber uh, of pi over xi. And I should put here unit sphere. Okay. So that that uh, I have this fiber. This has dimension n. This is Legendre and has dimension n minus one. They intersect in a two n minus one dimensional uh, some manifold, the, the contact manifold, a unit tangent bundle. And we know that the inter intersection is transverse if the restriction of xi to x is uh, Morse. And we know that that's just typical. So with probability 1, this will happen. So now, I have an intersection, but I want to think, think of this intersection not as an intersection number. I want to think of it as an intersection cycle. So if I look at... I may be off by a sign, but we don't worry, need to worry about signs in here. Pi inverse of xi intersect uh, intersect uh, the unit conormal bundle is going to be a sum over v with the property that the differential of xi restricted to x at v is zero minus one. Uh, the index of minus c restricted to x at v, and th then the intersection is going to be a point, and I'll write it as a delta function, just to indicate it's a, it, it's a point, delta c v. So this is going to be a zero-dimensional current, and it's a cycle, and the, uh, this cycle, the, the, the weights associated to those points, the multiplicity, so the, just recall what are the Morse indices, in a sense. So what, what you see here, that the, nor the nor union conormal bundle is a catalog of all the Morse behavior of all linear functions restricted to x. So in codes, if you want to know uh, what are the indices, what are the indices of this function, you, you, of a linear function, well, you intersect the fiber over C with this normal unit, normal uh, bunk, normal bundle, and you pick up the critical point and minus one times the Morse index. And minus one times the Morse index is a more, more interesting quantity. Good. And what else? We had we had some uh, some canonical forms. Um, let me let me get the the indices. Let me get the indices right. I don't know where they start. They start at zero or a one. Um, Yes, kappa 0, kappa n minus 1, they belong, these are forms of degree n minus 1 on the unit tangent bundle of V, and these are O n invariant with respect to the natural, uh, the natural action. In fact, they form a basis of, of the space. And then we had... We had the volume, volume of uh, the tube of radius r around x is going to be sum. So remember, m is the dimension of x, and c is n minus m is the co-dimension of x. And uh, m is the dimension of x. N is the dimension of the ambient space. When you take the fixed point set, you say the fixed point set of O N with little 
Uh, oh, A-N, yes, thank you, thank you, you're right. You're right, thank you, thank you. Um, so we have uh, a sum of the following type, sum from uh, j equals 0 to m, omega c plus j, r c plus j, mu m minus j x. So it's a polynomial. I mean, the lowest degree term is uh, the core dimension. And these are uh, volumes of unit balls of the corresponding dimensions. And uh, what do we have? Um, we have that mu m minus j uh, of x is going to be the integral over the unit normal bundle. Uh, kappa m minus j. This is a form of degree n minus 1. Uh, and this has degree n minus 1, because, uh, dimension n minus 1, because it's Legendrian, so it's the right dimension. And here, it's a constant, and it's going to be, let me say, sigma c minus 1 plus j. So, sigma k is the area of a k-dimensional unit sphere. Okay. It doesn't matter. The point then, and there is something that um, I mentioned last time. So this is uh, this happens for for um, very small uh, for very small r. This is Vars two formula. So the volume of a tube is polynomial, but more importantly, these quantities called curvature measures of x are intrinsic invariants uh, of x. They can be expressed as universal polynomials in the curvature uh, of uh, x. So the last term, the top degree term, mu n, is going to be the Euler characteristic uh, of m. And th that's when you identify that polynomial, you end up with gauss bonnet OK. So what I want to do. I want to associate to rather large classes of sets, very singular, sitting in V, a Legendrian cycle that keeps track of the Morse theory of the linear functions on X. Now, I have to tell you what Morse theory, we're doing a bit of singular Morse theory, it's a homological Morse theory. And then I can define the curvature measures in this fashion. Once I would have something that resembles in a normal bundle, but associated to uh, a singular set, then uh, I can hope to introduce curvature measures. Now, the example I, I have in mind, the, 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 so as an example of a singular, uh, as an example of a singular set. Let's take a star like this, just a simple star. Well, this is singular. And what is going to be the, the cycle, the, the, this thing? Well, take a tube, well, properly defined. This is an R2. This is a picture in R2. Take a tube around it, a small radius. So this is a nice sort of tubular neighborhood of, of this set X. Let me call this XR. Now, if I choose it carefully, if I choose it carefully, this is going to be a domain with C2 boundary. And there's a Gauss map. You, you look at the outer normal. You look at the outer normal uh, uh, around this domain. So this is a Gauss map. You look at this gra Gauss, gr the graph of the Gauss map as a subset in the unit tangent bundle. Yeah. It is a subset in the unit tangent bundle. In this case, uh, n equals 2 in this picture, the graph of the, uh, the, graph of the uh, Gauss map um, 
is going to be one dimensional. It's a, a Legendrian curve in, 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 in the story. And we know something. The differential properties of the Gauss map pick up the curvature of the set. So uh, the, the graph of the Gauss map and so the, the, the infinitesimal properties of this, of, of this graph capture the curvature. How it twists, how, how, this, how this normal angle twists. Yes? So this is the same as the core normal bundle of the boundary of the tube material? Yes, that's what's going to be. Uh, so you're asking about the... Uh, oh, is is it Gauss map? Uh, Gauss, this is going to be the graph of the Gauss map is going to be the normal uh, cycle of the d tubular neighborhood. No, the conormal, the conormal, I'm taking only out the outer direction. I'm taking only the outer direction. So the, the, the conormal, the, the conormal, uh, uh, the normal cycle of the boundary, it's going to be a curve. So it's going to be two curves because I'm taking unit sphere. So it's going to be two curves, one corresponding to the outer normal and one corresponding to the unit in, in a normal. So I'm, I'm only picking the outer normal. I just work, I, I work, I work with these conditions. So now I have a cycle. Here's the miracle. If I let R go to zero, this cycle converges in the sense of currents to something. And remarkably, no matter how I took the tubular neighborhood, because I can take the tubular neighborhood in many ways, the limit is going to be the same. And that, that is going to be the normal cycle of the singular set, which you can view as a graph as of a possibly non-existent Gauss map. Because, I mean, think, think how the, the, the normal vector happens here as I approach. It's going to perform a, quite a bit of rotation around here. So if you, look, if you, think, if you think like you're moving on a cylinder, as you approach here, you're going to do quite a bit of twist per, per unit of distance. So you're going to get some, some blow-up behavior in there. Now, this is not going to work for arbitrary singular sets. I mean, it it, might on the well, I mean, the way I remember, I, I was um, uh, reading a quote from Heisenberg. Uh, uh, you can say nothing about everything and everything about nothing. The problem is to just hit the middle ground. So if you work with arbitrary sets, good luck with that. And I want a class of sets that's sufficiently general that, for example, it consists of all, um, of all uh, simplicial complexes, affine simplicial complexes, manifolds with boundary, Unions of such, such. Okay, so I want, I want, um, uh, and I, because here we have, because here we, we have issues of uh, convergence, currents, things about areas will be important because you need some boundaries, some compactness results. So. You want to avoid sets that look like the graph of sine of 1 over x, which is a bounded curve with infinite length, highly oscillatory. So things like that, we don't want that. So fortunately for me, the logicians have been working hard at, hard at it since early 80s, and before them, uh, there were pioneers, and I should mention um, Gabrielov and uh, Hironaka that uh, worked on this. And even before that, Yuyasevich in Poland, who d developed the theory of uh, semi-algebraic sets and the theory of semi-analytic sets, but he himself realized the theory of semi-analytic semi sets is not good. And Hironaka proposed a theory, and then and logicians had a stroke of genius. So here's what I call, 
I'm happy Anand is not here because he will criticize me for changing their terminology, the uh, logicians. I found it's pretty dry and they cannot sell their good stuff. So what is the structure? So in other words, I'm looking, I'm, I want to construct a category of topological spaces and uh, maps between them. So the sets will be sets, subsets of Rn. So that's what is a structure. It's a collection of subsets of Rn. S upper n uh, is, consists of subsets of, of, uh, of up, uh, uh, R upper R upper n. Uh, so I want this to be a bit large. I want, first of all, to contain all the real algebraic uh, subsets in Rn. So it's pretty, pretty general. Um, now I want to contain all uh, affine uh, half all our fine half spaces. Okay, that's good. Uh, I want this uh, collection of sets to be closed under normal Boolean operations, finite union, finite intersections, uh, taking complements, and Cartesian product, product. And also, I mean, I, I want to have a way of transitioning from sets in uh, some Rn to sets and some other Rm. So uh, the typical example is just uh, the image of such a set by an affine map is still in our collection. Uh, good. So now, just some terminology. And you'll see why the word S definable is very good. So the sets in this collection will be called S definable. And um, a map between definable sets is called definable if its graph is definable. So in particular, in particular, definable maps need not be continuous. I will specify when they are continuous. Now, such a category or structure is called tame if it satisfies an axiom, and this is where our colleague uh, Anand Pillay and his friend Spanhorn discovered in the early 80s, this condition. The condition says the structure is tame if the only, in, uh, only definable subsets of the real axis are very simple, finite unions of open intervals and points. Okay. So for example, the set of integers is not going to be definable because it's infinite. It's an infinite collection of a discrete, infinite discrete set. Okay. Now, look, look, this is a pretty, pretty stringent assumption on the structure because what it says, take any definable set in Rn and take any linear map into R. The image is going to be defining, meaning is going to be a union of intervals and points. So that's pretty severe. I mean, do such things exist, first of all? And the, the, the first is um, the semi-algebraic sets. You, you look at the collection of semi-algebraic sets, sets defined, defined by, sets defined by uh, finite, uh, finitely many algebraic equalities and inequalities. And um, um, it was due to the work of Yosevich and several other people that was showed in the 50s that this is a tame structure in this sense. But they didn't, they didn't uh, come up with nail this O minimality condition. Uh, they showed it's a result known in the 19th century that every semi algebraic subset of uh, R is a finite union of points and open intervals. And then, uh, and then they showed that the, the semi-algebraic sets satisfy all the, the properties there. Now, so we have, and that's the smallest um, uh, tame uh, category. It's the smallest tame. It's the smallest tame category. The next one. 
The next one is the uh, category of sub-analytic sub -analytic objects. So I'll explain what it is. Uh, so we've defined so semi-algebraic sets. Then S sub n is going to be sub-analytic sub -analytic sets. So I'll give a definition which is a bit more restrictive than the, what Hironaka uh, described. So a function f from b to r, b in rn open ball, is called a restricted analytic function if is the restriction I'll say it in words because it pains me to write if is the restriction of an analytic function defined on a bigger open set okay the point here is the ball is a bounded set the function sine x is not a restricted analytic function because it's defined on uh, the real axis. However, sine x restricted on 0 to pi is a restricted analytic function. Okay. So now, you look at all the zero sets of restricted analytic functions. Okay. So now look at the smallest structure that contains these sets. So in other words, take unions of these, the intersections, complements, Cartesian products, project them, project them uh, in different spaces, uh, take intersection with half planes, do all of this. And you get, you get the smallest structure that contains these sets. And the results of, I'll mention three names. Hironaka, Gabrielov, and Robert Hart show that this structure that you get is tame. It is a very hard theorem. It is a very hard theorem. And a major breakthrough happened in the 90s. What is SX? I'll give you an, a special instance of it. So we have this tame structure of subanalytic sets. And I'll throw another set in the, po in the pot. Namely, I'll throw in the pot the graph of the exponential function. This is not a restricted analytic function because it's defined on, on an unbounded set. Then what I do, I look at the smallest structure that contains subanalytic objects and the graph of the exponential. It's huge. In particular in this, in this, in this uh, story you will have functions of the type e minus 1 over x or e minus 1 over x squared. You have flat functions. These functions subanalytic and subalgebraic are rigid. They essentially determined by finite, finite germs. Here you throw in it, you throw in here, smooth functions that are flat, they're not determined by the germs. And Alex Wilkie proved that what you get, uh, what you get here is still O minimal. I don't understand the proof. I, I tried, I asked Sergey, and he uses, the proofs typically follow this pattern. They do a sort of pre-resolutions of singularities show the singularities have some nice form and then involve some model theoretic compactness theorem. So when I got to that I gave up. So since then they, this has been enlarged, this has been enlarged considerably that you can do the classical differential topology you can do it in a tame context. So that, this is the good thing. 
Now, all you do is not just that, you can do flows. I mean, I looked at all the classical Morse functions on Lie groups, on Grassmannians, on this, on that. Everything that appears there, the flows, the are maps in a 10 category, these stratification by unstable manifolds, these are maps, tame, uh, tame subsets in a, in a and you'll see that working in a 10 category, you can avoid all sorts of pathology, plus you can do intersection theory in a very nice way. Good. So, I'm, I, I'm spending I'm spending a bit more time on this because this is a jewel of mathematics that geometers do not know. And when I hear, when I tell them things you can do, they think this is not true. This is magic. I shouldn't advertise because I, you have so much power working in this category. And you can be a true geometrist because you don't need to know model theory. You need to know some facts. And when you don't know, you ask Sergey. So, you can concentrate. Uh, you can concentrate on uh, on geometry. So, why is called definable? Why is called definable? Because this has a lot to do with everyday language. So, suppose I have some sets there, are, and, I, and, and I'll give examples. I'll make a general statement. Logicians here will cringe. Uh, I'm going to say it's first order logic, uh, but. Um, Roughly, in the naive way, is this. Suppose I have some sets that I know already they are tame, you know, definable. And now I describe a set using only the logical operator and or not, and the quantifiers exist and for any. And whatever set comes out of this description is going to be tame. So, I mean, basically, what you, this, the argument is you think about a situation and you have to phrase it clearly so the only words that you're using are these logical operators, these quantifiers, and you make sure you do not use sets that are not tame, like, for example, the sets of, set of integers. Okay, so let me, let me give, yes. A generating set of what? So you said like a team. So like you said that uh, things that you can obtain by like and or not whatever uh, from same stuff ends up tame or whatever something like that. No 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 no. Uh, so uh, so for example, for the algebraic uh, the same algebraic set, the generating set consists of algebraic varieties. Then you do just like think of the good example is Borel algebra. The generating set of Borel algebra are open intervals. And then you do unions, countable unions, uh, intersections, uh, complements, uh, and you get the sigma algebra. And the open intervals are generators. Same here, the only problem you're not allowed to do countable unions, you're not allowed to do countable intersections. But then you do all these set theoretic operations, unions, Cartesian products, and, and that, that, that takes to be very difficult. You project the simplest case, I mean, and it's equivalent to what I said. You, you, sit, uh, on, uh, you take a tame subset in Rn, and you project it in R2, for example. What you get there should also be in your category. So if you start with generating sets and then you smash them on all dimensions and project, you're going to get a huge collection of sets. But then no matter what you do, when you project them on the real axis, what you, all you can see is intervals of points. Finitely many. So th this, is, this is shocking. Because you have a lot, but not a lot to destroy, to to uh, create pathologies of the images, some contour set on the real axis. Okay. I mean, it, to me, it looked like they're very restrictive, and suddenly, anything I could do in finite dimensional topology, I could do it in, in, in the same category. So. 
and just on a naive way, sets definable and tame categories can be obtained by a finite process. Like, for example, these Casson handles, they're not tame. There's some funny, there's, there's, there's a very interesting uh, result that says if you start with a homology three sphere, let's say Poincare sphere, you do a double suspension. Uh, and let me say, this operation takes care, takes, you can express it in, in, a, in a 10 category because Poincare sphere is defined by, by an algebraic equation. You can do suspension very easily. You can do double suspension. And the result, I, I forgot the authors, I'm getting old, says this is homeomorphic to S5. This is very strange. However, this homeomorphism is not tame. So whatever homeomorphism is there, there's an infinite process that produces it. And I find that revealing. I mean, I don't know. I just philosophically very interesting. And th that's why this, this result is so surprising, because you cannot imagine this in finite time. It takes some induction, some infinite induction. Some, it's, it's, it's a very, very clever result. So. Um, Good. So let me give you, let me give uh, some, uh, two examples of how working with English language produces new sets. Okay. Okay, I'll move here. Okay, I have time to erase. I'm going slower than I, but if, if you will take something of this lecture, take my word for it. These tame sets are a gift. So, uh, let, me give any, let me give two examples, and then I will list a few properties of tame sets and tame maps that will blow your mind. So, um, here's a here's a first simple example. You, if we have A in R n definable, so typically when you say definable, you need to explain what is the category in which is definable. But I'll fix a tame out any tame uh, category. So it's definable in that category, and we have. F from A to R definable, and um, uh, I should put here RM definable, and B in RM definable. Then the pre image, the pre image of, uh, of B is definable. Okay, so uh, here's how, how here's, uh, I, I want to give you a taste of some arguments. Um, so, here, let me denote by pi the projection from Rn cross Rm into the first component. So, F inverse of B is pi graph of f intersect a cross b. That's what it is. Huh? So the pre-image of an indefinable is definable. Here's something that's less obvious. If you take a, if you take a definable subset of Rn, its closure is always definable. OK? So this is. This is the example that Sergei gave me to convince me this is, this is good. Um, so A in Rn definable implies the closure of A 
is definable. So let me, let me dis describe the closure of A in terms of quantifiers, logical operators, and definable sets. So the closure of A consists of all points X in Rn such that for any epsilon in the set zero infinity, there exists a point A and A such that um, x minus a squared less or equal than epsilon squared. Now, this is a set. What set is the preimage uh, of this, uh, this, this set by a quadratic map, which a it's by a polynomial map, and that's the definable object. And you can prove directly, you can prove directly using the, the properties that indeed is indeed definable. But notice, I have expressed in words, and no, and at, at, at each stage, I have only these logical operations. And this inequality is really describes a set. Yeah. Good. Now, here are some nice properties of tame, of tame sets. And the you can use them. Uh, you can use them uh, I mean frequently. So everything, all these properties, all this proof can be found in this book of Lou van den Dries. I don't know how to pronounce his name. He, he is an uh, uh, Urbana. He works at Urbana, but he's Dutch, and it's called tame topology. I may be, I may be wrong, but uh, or tame geometry, something like that. It's a, it's a very nice book. So uh, let me fix R, a positive integer. Okay, one. Every tame set admits a stratification by uh, CR sum manifolds. So it's a finite, it's a finite union of CR sum manifolds. In fact, R is arbitrary. It could be twenty-three, but you have to fix it in, in advance. So if you give me an integer, 17, then I can find a stratification by some manifolds of class C17. So you think ahead, how many derivatives do I need? You'll have them. Uh, so, and I define, one can define the dimension of a tame set to be the dimension of, the largest dimension of a stratum. And then, you, with a bit of work, you, there's a bit of non-trivial work to show that the dimension is independent of how you stratify. Moreover, the stratification can be chosen so that it satisfies two, uh, uh, two regularity conditions, Whitney condition and a better one, Verdier. In, in this case, Verdier condition. I'm not going to go through the details. Verdier condition implies Whitney condition, and Verdier condition is the one that you need to do stratified Morse theory. It doesn't matter. The, 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 the strata meet nicely. It's a normal equisangularity, but if you look at how much work Goreski and McPherson do and stratify in, in this uh, stratify Morse theory book. And they may need to make various assumptions and they say, well, examples when they're satisfied and the examples where they're satisfied are semi-algebraic sets and sub-analytic sets. In fact, that theory works in any tame category but, and if you use the full machinery of tame sets, you can simplify dramatically 
uh, what the arguments in the book because they spend a lot of time to show that certain path pathologies do not happen, whereas these are eliminated from start in, in, in a tame carrier way. Good. Uh, then another, any tame set or definable is triangulable. Tame set X. Now, I, I want to say that this is a strong result. I didn't say that the set X is compact or closed, it could be unbounded. So, what do I mean by triangulation? You look at its uh, closure in the one point compactification, the sphere at infinity. That compact set admits a triangulation, meaning there's a finite simplicial complex in a tame homeomorphism on a definable homeomorphism on that compactification. And the set X is a union of open faces. Think for a good example, start with a stupid example, the interval zero open, one closed. It has a triangulation, zero, one open, it's an open simplex, and one. So that's, so it, it kind of knows what's missing. Now, we, we can define a, an Euler characteristic, the definable Euler characteristic, um, chi definable of x is sum over all sigma minus one dimension of sigma. So the summation is over all open uh, faces in a triangulation, okay? So for example, Let's take, let's take, for example, the interval, uh, the, let's take chi of the set, 0, 1. It's going to be, it's going to have one face, one, uh, one zero face, and uh, one, one dimensional face. So it's going to be 1 minus 1, it's going to be 0. The uh, or definable order characteristic of uh, the open interval 0, 1 is minus 1. And in fact, for a locally closed tame set, the definable order characteristic is the order characteristic of its Borel Moore homology. You allow for, or homology, you allow for unbounded simp simplicity in, in, in the story. Uh, now, there's a whole work to prove that this definition is well-defined independent of triangulation. And uh, notice, this is not going to be a homotopy invariant. This is not going to be a homotopy invariant. Uh, here's something beautiful. So if I have x is tame, f from uh, x to r, um, a tame function, I didn't say continuous, it's just a tame function, then I can find a stratification by definable strata, strata of class CR so that the restriction of f to each stratum is CR. Just look at, at the simplest case when x is an open interval on the, zero, on the real axis, and f is a definable, act, a, a definable function. It means there's a finite subdivision on this interval, so that on each subinterval is the class CR. It shows that tame functions of one variable are the ones you picture your students. Sine of 1 over x, why is not sine of 1 over x uh, a definable function? Let's think about it. Look at its graph and take its intersection with the zero axis. Intersection with the zero axis is going to be countable. That's not a tame set because zero, the x-axis is a definable set. So you avoid these things. 
Now, if you take a k-dimensional uh, bounded tame set, it has finite k-dimensional Hausdorff measure. So, for example, a bounded curve has finite length. A bounded surface has finite area. I mean, and a bounded tame surface, uh, and a bounded two-dimensional thing, is just essentially what? It's a, a bunch of two-dimensional strata, some curves, and some points. Yeah? So what it says, those strata, they, 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 have, they have finite area. And the reason they have finite area, because the only way you can have infinite area if those strata oscillate a lot, and they build a lot of area in a, in a small room. But the oscillation, as this example of sine 1 over x shows, oscillation is not allowed in, 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 in this category. Now, here's another thing. Suppose I have a continuous map, a continuous t map from x to y. Okay. Then, I can find a triangulation of y, definable triangulation. So that over each open face, this is a trivial vibration. That is beautiful. And he, here's what it says. Because I have finally many triangles here in this triangulation. There are only finally many topological data, topological types of in the fibers. And this was used by Holansky to prove some some remarkable bounds on, 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 on the, the, the topology of uh, uh, families of sets. He introduced essentially a new tame category. So I'm not going to give a proof, but here's how the tame sets look like. So let's make, let's make a y to be the real axis. And I'm going to draw a tame set. Anything that I can finish in finite time is going to be tame. So, okay, so that's a tame set. And let's look at pro projection on, the, uh, on this axis. Here I, I have fibers. You see, there's this interval. Uh, there is this interval where the fiber consists of three points. And then there's this interval where the fiber consists of two points. And there's this interval where the fiber consists of one point. And there are some endpoints in between with their bifurcation point. Okay. And one, one final result, and um, I think I'll finish with uh, today's topic. It's called the Caesar equivalence. This is a really beautiful result. So what does it mean? A bijection, I didn't say continuous, between two tame sets, a definable bijection. Means there is an, this is going to be, uh, here's an example. Take a, a piece of paper and cut it, and according to some pattern, and put the pieces together. Now you have two different sets, you have two different sets, and it's obviously a bijection between the original sheet and uh, what the pieces that were left there. You can do even something more dramatic. You can take the pieces and glue them together, and you still have a bijection. And it's definable because it follows a finite time algorithm. So now, let's see what happens. What are invariants of these Caesar equivalents? So I, I will say that set such things, such sets are scissor equivalent. First of all, when you cut a set with the scissors, you cannot destroy the dimension. Because you are allowed to do only finally many cuts. If you could do infinitely many cuts, yeah, of course, you get you know, a grinder. But you cannot do that. And another thing, let's, let's look at an, a simple example in dimension zero. So two, two zero-dimensional sets will be in bijection if and only if you have the same cardinality. Everybody knows that. But cardinality is the same as the Euler characteristic. And another invariant on the Caesar equivalence, imagine 
that you cut according to a simplicity decomposition, then it's clear that you, you just have the same simplest just put in a different order, so it's clear that they have the same Euler characteristic. And the theorem says two sets are scissor equivalent if and only if they have the same dimension and the same definable Euler characteristic. That is a really beautiful result. So I will stop here next time, like they say in Muppet Show. Uh, I will use tame sets to define uh, tame currents, and because I want to do um, intersection theory, and uh, then I can define I can define the normal the normal cycles of tame sets of any compact tame set or any bounded tame set. And then I'll prove various properties. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Just really brief, you better should have asked it earlier, but what does definable mean? Definable? Definable means uh, that it belongs to a certain category. And that category itself is defined by an initial collection of sets and, and a, a collection of allowable operations. So a set is definable if you start, if you can be obtained by starting from these atoms, performing Boolean operations and Cartesian products and projections. Okay? And when you, when you do that, no, what does it mean? The half planes uh, belong here. It means you are allowed to use inequalities. Because a half plane, it says a linear functional is greater than a constant. So, but you can cut this down because the linear function is going to be a definable thing. So you, you, all you have to say is that half lines are defined are in your set because the pre-image of a half line by a linear function is a half plane. And O minimal, that's, they are the godfathers of uh, this, which is really, they shouldn't work for a, a, an ad agency, it means order minimal. And there's, this is only what I know, it's much wider. You can work with other order fields and you can allow for inf infinitesimals. Uh, so it, it, it's, a, it's a very powerful, it's a very powerful theory. Uh, so, the only thing you, you cannot do is, uh, is work in infinite dimensions. And, and thinking about it, I realized something that's surprising. I mean, it's really surprising. In our attempt to understand finite dimensional spaces, we jump to infinite dimensions. First case, fundamental group. You work with a group of loops that's eminently infinite dimensional. Then you do homotopy groups. Then, you, so you go with a singular homology. Forget gauge theory. So somehow, we need to go high up in the heavens to understand what's down to Earth. And I don't know if you can live without the fundamental group, for example. It's just too important. So passing to infinite dimensions may be a necessity.